Hello, my name is John Lee and I'm the president of Alpha Training and Consulting and I have a true passion for preparing uh, students for ASQ certification exams. With that being said though, today we're going to go over practice, practice exam questions for the ASQ CSQP exam and those questions are going to come out of the CSQP primer uh, which is published by Quality Council of Indiana. What a great group of people they are. They gave me permission to use these questions for this video so we greatly appreciate them and uh, we use this primer in our online class by the way we have you listen to all the lectures take the exams and we have you review the primer and uh, then I go over all the questions in the primer with you uh, for a video so I'm just giving you a sampling of some of those we answer a lot more questions should you be interested in taking our class if you want to learn more about our class just go to www.asqcsqp dot com again that's asqcsqp.com and it will teach you more about the class and there's many questions there that are answered concerning the asqcsqp exam so please check that out when you have a chance uh, but in the meantime let's move forward and look at some of these exam questions and uh, i'm going to go through these one at a time and show you the logic i use to derive at the answer that i get which may or may not be correct i don't get a hundred percent on these um, but hopefully you'll find it helpful. I don't look a lot of them up because I don't want to waste time. You watching me look something up is a waste of your time. So I don't spend much time looking things up. Um, but let's get started and again hopefully this will help you prepare for your certification exam. A lot of these, I don't, I, I don't answer them from information I've read from the primer. I'll be honest with you, I haven't even read this primer but I understand the logic of ASQ and that's how I go about getting to the right answer. Some of these I don't know it'd be kinda hard to look them up as my guess so what I want you to do is learn that same logic. If you get that logic down these aren't such difficult test questions they're really not. So let me see if I can't help ingrain that uh, logic into your mind. 2.1 a company should first consider which of the following items before entering a strategic alliance. Okay, a strategic alliance. And first of all, I'd like to break this up for you. There's strategic, there's tactical, and there's operational. And you've got to understand that if you're going to get through this chapter. Strategic is big, sky, dreaming, general stuff. Tactical, uh, so the CEO has the vision. The tactical team comes in and says, what we need to create a plan to where we can make this vision become a reality that's tactical is planning and then operational is implementing the plan to help you reach the strategic vision and so if you will remember those three elements this is going to be a lot easier for you but what they're talking about here before what do you need to do before entering a strategic alliance the results of incoming material reports Okay, remember this kind of uh, pie in the sky stuff, that's uh, rather specific. Their own strengths and weaknesses could be the financial soundness of the targeted partner, the productivity and cost structure of the prospective partner. Okay, they could all be correct. They could all be correct. And whenever you have multiple correct answers, what do we do? we pick the more general one. So I switch gears and say which one is the most general and I pick B, their own strengths and weaknesses I think is the best answer for this question. Uh, because when you enter into a strategic alliance there's a good chance you only have one shot at this. So from a business person myself I can tell you this before you do that you better make sure that you, ha you have everything organized and you're giving yourself the best possible chance to succeed. And so I'd say that, their own strengths and weaknesses. So let's look at that, 2.1, uh, it is B, so that is correct. On which of the following would quality improvement in an organization be most properly based? Quality improvement in an organization be most properly based? Sometimes I stop and think, well, what does a good answer look like? And uh, on this one, on which of the following would quality improvement in an organization be most properly based? Okay, I think it will, it could be a couple of things. It could be customer based, because that, remember, that's one of the value systems of ASQ. 
it's customer based um, but I don't know it could be many other things so let's look and pick the best one a good inspection system no way 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 too specific and ASQ doesn't like solving problems by inspection anyway they think you should design quality into the product and then you should uh, have a system that is so good that you've reduced variability so much the probability of getting a bad part is so remote that you get rid of inspection so inspection is kind of a curse word to ASQ if you understood the history of quality in our modern age you'd know why I'm not going to go over that right now, but I know inspection is not going to be what you base your organization on. Okay, so that's out, no doubt. A preventative quality system supported by upper management. This is going to be very hard to beat, this one, because it's an excellent answer. Why? Preventative. You're fixing it before it takes place. ASQ would rather have you be preventative than corrective. Preventative action, you're fixing it before it takes place you identify that hey this could happen let's put something in place so it doesn't corrective action when it's already a bad incident has already taken place and you fix it that's corrective so they like preventative and supported by upper management that's probably the correct answer I don't think you're gonna get much better than that uh, the one that would be if it said something about the customer okay a vision statement endorsed by all members of management hmm okay I'm gonna leave C in there excellent work instructions and immediate corrective action when failure no corrective action is going to be trumped by preventative action D is out of there A and D are out so that's how you answer these if you don't know right off you get it down to two then you can focus and compare the two a preventative quality system let's read this first on which of the following would quality improvement in an organization be most properly based A preventative quality system supported by upper management. A vision management endorsed. If they're just endorsing, I don't think that's strong enough. I, I go with B. But that's, uh, I can see uh, uh, some good points of C. But this is more, you know, put rubber meets the road. And I think this is very important. So I say B. 2.2 is B, so that is correct. In this section, I'd say the most helpful page in the whole primer of chapter three is the risk mitigation plan and on this uh, revision it's page 10 so anyway this is a very good page but there are quite a few uh, good critical stack pages that will help you through here and quite a few tab pages as well alright with that being said let's go ahead and get started shall we any action taken to reduce the probability and or consequences of an adverse outcome from a development project is called well I already know because I've studied enough and this was on one of my pages I believe but reduce the probability is a key word for what mitigation uh, so 3.1 uh, should be a I looked at the wrong column there had me kind of scared there for a little bit and so this would be a but I can't remember if it's in your critical stack or your tab pages there's a page that goes through all of these and uh, transference is when you get an insurance policy so you pay someone to take the risk you're transferring it to someone else avoidance is when you just you're not reducing the probability well you are but you're redesigning it to completely uh, get rid of the risk and acceptance is okay I've done everything I can really afford to do is there still risk there yes I'm willing to take that risk that's acceptance so you should know those or be able to look them up quickly again I think that's in your tab pages if I remember correctly and so you should be able to look that up quickly if as needed what is the primary purpose of a failure mode and effects and criticality analysis now I didn't put this into the uh, critical stack the FAMIA stuff because I feel if you listen to my lecture on this you should be able to get most of these correct without looking them up so I left FAMIA and FAMIA completely off the critical stack and tab pages because I felt like you would get that through the online module and wouldn't have to look these up so what is the primary purpose of a failure mode effects and criticality analysis to learn as much about the item as possible after qualification test 
that's too specific. Qualification test. That thing's out of there. To determine the way an item will most likely fail and to help d obtain design safeguards, that's good. Remember, ASQ likes you to solve problems in design, so B has a lot going for it. And so right now I say it's B. To determine by extensive analysis. No, for me it's not extensive analysis. You don't run things through the reliability lab. You don't do reliability analysis on it. So it's not extensive. It's somewhat subjective. So that one's out of there. To determine the cause of a failure by dissecting the item. No, we don't dissect the item. It's a group of people going through things conceptually and trying to figure out what uh, could possibly go wrong. If it does go wrong, how will it impact the customer? What's the cause of it, etc.? So I'd say B on this one. 3.2 is B. That's correct. 4.5, when comparing various suppliers for a given product or service, the preferred method from the option below is. So let me push this up here so I can see the rest of it. Okay, when comparing various suppliers for a given product or service, so you're comparing them, the preferred method is the supplier's quality manual and having ISO 9001. When they put that in an answer choice, it's usually wrong, just so you know. So ISO 9001, what if they work in the aircraft? They'd need AS 9100. Or, or what if they were in the hospital industry? ISO 1345. A is out of there. Industry rankings, online reviews, and reputation? Maybe, but n not everyone is involved in industry rankings or online reviews. So, could be B, but I don't think so. There it is right here, past quality. I can already tell you that ASQ believes, and rightfully so, that the best, uh, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. So there it is, past quality, delivery, and responsiveness compared to requirement. Please make a mental note of that. It's going to help you on the test. But just from past or history, I know C is correct. Which of the following is typically created during product design? Product design, safety features and product reliability? Yes, that's where you create reliability and safety features. I know more about reliability because I'm a reliability engineer. Uh, but reliability is definitely created in design, big time. So I know it's A, and so are safety features, but I really knew it was reliability. So manufacturing specifications and product user manuals, product reliability and sales price. No, sales price is set by marketing people. Product identification and discount rate. No, no, those are easy to get rid of. It'll come down to... Uh, I guess in my top two would be A and C, but A is much better. So 4.7 is A, and it is. In the automotive sector, APQP, uh, Advanced Product Quality Control Plan, <laughs> identifies what control plan for the early development stages of a product. Okay, I know early development stages, early development is going to be prototype. So it's a word alignment there. 5.5 .5 is going to be D. And that is correct. And that's a lookup one. That's a lookup one. A lot of these in this chapter are lookup ones. Uh, the problem is you can't look up everything or you're not going to have enough time. So hopefully you study this well enough that you don't have to look them all up. The lengths of a certain bushing are normally distributed with mean X bar. Okay. How many standard deviation units symmetrical about X bar will include 80% of the lengths? So this is a Z statistic problem, and I'm going to draw it out. <clears throat> so here we go. So we have this normal distribution. It said it was normally distributed, and it said it was 80%. 80% meaning 80% about the mean. So it's this area that I have hatched right there which means this area has to be 10% on each side. And now if we add all of this up, we have 80 plus this 10 is 90 plus this 10 is 100. So now all, of the, all that I need to do is go to the Z table and look up 10%. So let's do that. This is a very common type question. So here we are. And I have to go into this table, and I'm going to blow this up just a bit. 
to help us out. Let it focus there for a little bit and uh, then we're going to go down here and I always go down the center column. I'm looking for 10 percent and notice this is 40, 30, 20, 17, 14, 12, 10. This is 8 so it's somewhere right in here. I'm going to need to move this over so I can read it. Okay. And so this is the 10 percent. It's going to be somewhere right in here. So it's going to be 1.2 something sigmas and there's the 10. It's between these two. This is 8. This is 9. So it's going to be somewhere around 1.28 and 1.29. How do I know that? Because I moved this up. I have to. Let me see if I, yeah, yeah, I can move it down. So there it is, 1.2, there's my 10% there, so it's 1.28, 1.28, and that's how you do that one. So make sure you feel comfortable in doing that. <clears throat> Using that Z table is very important. 515 is C, 1.28 sigmas. Okay, 515 is C, it is indeed C. 6.7, when comparing breakthrough achievement with Kaizen techniques, which of the following statements is true? Breakthrough is very aggressive. Rip everything out, start from scratch, new technology, etc. Very expensive, very time consuming, and somewhat risky perhaps. Kaizen techniques is slow, incremental improvement over time. So Kaizen, te Kaizen techniques provide more rapid improvement? No. Breakthrough achievement is generally less expensive. No, it's more. Breakthrough achievement would be used for low-tech products, not necessarily. Kaizen techniques are more easily applied at the floor level. Yes, Kaizen techniques were designed for the floor level. So 6.7 has to be D, and it is. 6.13, what could happen if the supplier is at too high of a percentage of capacity with a single customer? Well, that puts you at a, in a vulnerable situation. They may be too dependent on the customer, yes, and it also has maybe a non-absolute. I'm pretty sure it's A. That just pushed it over the top, maybe. Quality may deteriorate. Oh, that's a non-absolute also. Percentage of capacity. Uh, no, quality may deteriorate. I wouldn't say that, but you're too dependent on the customer. Well, that would be the correct answer. Productivity will decrease, not necessarily, usually increases as you get more uh, orders. On-time delivery may suffer. There's another non-absolute, so that didn't help us too much because it's in all of them pretty much. On-time delivery may suffer. Uh, no, not necessarily. If you have a large customer with a lot of orders, you tend to get good and better over time. If you're making a lot of money off of it, the company's usually more willing to invest money in it. So of all these options, I would say A is the best. Maybe too dependent on the customer. I've seen companies that will even refuse business because it will take up too large of a percentage of their business and they like their portfolio spread over many customers. So A is definitely it. 613 is A. That is correct. What is the upper control limit for a P-chart proportion defective when the average daily production is 2,500 units with an established fraction defective of uh, 5 one hundredths there? So it even tells you what chart to use, the p-chart. So this one isn't too bad. If I remember correctly, I brought down, uh, yes I did, this is one of my favorite slides for attribute data charts. And uh, at the time of this publication, it's on page 55. Now, it said to use a p-chart, and so there it is. P-chart is per percent or proportion defectives. And uh, this is how you calculate p number of bad parts over the sample size, etc. And here's the formula. Upper control limit equals P bar plus 3 times sigma. This is the standard deviation formula for the binomial distribution when sample size is not constant. Uh, but uh, this did have constant sample size and therefore we could have used the P chart, uh, or the NP chart, I'm sorry. But uh, they didn't. They said they wanted to use the P chart. So these are the formulas we'll be using and plugging in. I would like to get this full chart uh, out there so I can show it to you. It works real well. It'll really help you on the test. Uh, so let's spend a little bit of time just looking at that. 
look what it says here. This is for attribute charts. Defectives, there's two possibilities, defectives and defects. Remember, defectives is bad parts, violated a spec limit, has to either be reworked, uh, regraded, or scrapped, or customer use as is. Uh, so defectives also comes from the binomial distribution. And notice down here, this column is for sample size varies, and this column is for sample size fixed. So if it's for defectives, you have to use one of these two. If sample size is fixed, you go over here, as it says right here. And if it varies, you use this column. Uh, this one did have constant sample size, but you can still use the p-chart, and the question asked us to use the p-chart, so we will do that. Here's defects. Remember what defects, defects and defectives are different animals from an analytical perspective, especially. Defects are flaws. And when you have flaws or defects, it's modeled by the Poisson. Defectives are bad, modeled by the binomial. You may need to know that on the test. Uh, but if it's defects, we use the Poisson distribution. You only have two uh, options here, U-chart or C-chart. And so hopefully you feel comfortable with this page uh, because it can really help you on the certification exam. Now let's get back to doing our... Uh, calculations here. So this is the formula again we're going to use is uh, are these right here, upper and lower control limit. And I'm going to write that on the whiteboard and we're going to plug the numbers in and uh, get this done. So let's go to the whiteboard. Alright, welcome to the whiteboard and I wrote down all the information from the question and here's the formula we need to use. The question only asks for the upper control limit so we don't need to worry about the lower, but the only difference is for the lower it's a minus three sigma here instead of a plus, as you're probably uh, familiar with. All right, let's go ahead and plug these numbers into this formula and do the calculation. So here we go, P bar is 0 0.05, 0 0.05 plus three times, and this says P bar right there, uh, since I'm a little scrunched on space, I'm just going to put down there 0 0.05 uh, times 1 minus p bar, 1 minus p bar, in other words, 1 minus 0 0.05 divided by the sa average sample size. Well, sample size was constant, so it's 2,500. 2,500. Okay. Now we just need to put this in our calculator and do it in the right order. Uh, we're going to do the square root first. We're going to do the parentheses first. So 1 minus 0 0.05. I'm going to do everything on my calculator here. So 1 minus 0 0.05 is uh, 1 minus 0 0.05 equals, there we go, 0.95. So I can replace all that in there with 0.95, which I'm going to do. Okay. Now I'm going to multiply 0.95 times 0.05 equals uh, 0 0.475 divided by 2500 equals and then I'm going to take the square root of that. And that gives me 0 .00435 right here. So I can erase this and put down that number, point, uh, 0.00435. Okay, then I'm going to multiply that by 3 times 3 equals, and that gives me 0 0.0130. So I can get rid of this and uh, replace that with my new number. This is the value of 3 sigma, by the way, 0 0.0130. 0, and uh, 0 0.01307. Seven. Seven. Okay, and that's what I have. Now I'm going to add this to 0.05 plus 0 
equals, and it's 0 0.063. So the upper control limit is going to equal 0 0.063. There we have it. Now let's go back to our question and see if that's one of the options. All right, here we are back at the question. And notice, there it is, 0 0.063. That's the one we uh, calculated. That is the correct answer. I checked it. It is C. 7.6, an experiment with two factors in which all levels of one variable are run at each level of the second variable is called. I already know what it is. Full factorial experiment is where you run all variable level combinations. Uh, so at C, 7.6 must be C, and it is. 8.1, the retention of prior audit records is of the greatest value to an audit function because of which of the following? The retention of prior audits is greatest value due to which of the following? It assists in the orientation and training of new auditors. It could, but that's not its primary purpose. Determines the timing necessary for a follow-up audit? No, these are retention of audit records. To assist, it assists in the preparation for the next audit? That could be. Uh, because when you go do a new audit, usually you look at the past audits so you can do follow-up and make sure things are implemented, implemented correctly and functioning properly. So my guess is it's C, but it could be it can provide backup record in case the client misplaces their report. Uh, I would say my best thought on this one would be C. So let's look at that, 8.1C, and uh, there it is, it is C. Very good. The trace forward method of process auditing, that's where you have a flow chart and you follow the flow chart as you audit. So you're following the process flow. So the trace forward, and you're going forward with the flow, trace backward is when you go back against the flow. Uh, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. But this is talking about the trace forward method of process auditing. Almost always saves time. Uh, not necessarily. We don't have enough information to, to say that. It is good for partial audits. Uh, it may be, but I don't think it's the best answer. Is good for auditor training. It's definitely good for auditor training because it, uh, the flow makes sense. If you start jumping around at different places, it just makes things more confusing. So thus far, I like C better than the other ones. Makes the understanding of product flow difficult. No, it actually makes it easier. So is good for the auditor training, I would say is C. 8.2 is C. 9.1, until recently, the members of a problem-solving team have been arguing about their different opinions. However, they are now discussing their common views. So it looks like they went through forming and they're in storming when they're arguing. And, but now they've gotten over the arguing and what's, so, what's next? Forming, storming, norming. Sounds like they're in the norming view uh, stage now. As a facilitator for the team, you recognize this stage as norming, C. 9.1 is C, and that is correct. That was a pretty easy one. Training is most effective when it is conducted by trained educators. That's a good thing. I don't know that it'll be the right answer. I think we could do better. The Human Resources Department provides it. No, that's too uh, uh, narrow of a scope. The employee has a desire to learn. Okay. I don't care who's training. If you have no desire to learn, uh, you're not going to get very far. So C would be better than A. The company makes it mandatory. Uh, no, not necessarily. Usually people do better if they're not forced into something. They have a passion about something and desire to learn. So this one is definitely C. 9.2 is it C. Yes, it is. Which of the following is a valid descriptor of organizational culture? Okay, this is a good question. Remember what culture is, is people acting out, or culture is observed by watching people act out on their value system. And so it has to have something to do with a value system. A system of shared meaning or beliefs held by all employees. So that could be it. Uh, again, we're always cautious of all. Uh, absolutes are usually incorrect, but it's not the most robust test-taking skill. So I see that as a red flag coming up. Uh, and there may be a better answer, but this will definitely uh, be an answer to that. But there may be a better one. What a company's business focus is? No, that's more of a mission statement or something like that. Assignments made 
commensurate with abilities and resources. No, it's not about making assignments. Uh, that's more like a project or something. A pattern of basic management assumptions. No, it has to do with shared beliefs, shared value system. So, A, I don't like the all there because you're always going to have some different employees, but of all the options, it has to be A. 10.5 is A. That is correct. The most widely used technique for distinguishing between chronic and insignificant problems is... The most widely used technique for distinguishing between chronic and insignificant problems. Hmm. Okay, I already know what it is. When I first read it, I was thinking SPC, and I was thinking normal cause and special cause. But that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about the Pareto diagram, uh, the 80-20 rule, as you'll recall. The, the significant few and the trivial many. That's the Pareto diagram. There is a control chart here, but after I read it and realized it wasn't about variation, I threw that one out. Cause and effect diagram, that's for gathering information uh, that is root cause type stuff. And a scatter diagram, no, that's uh, showing the relationship between variables. So this one has to be A, 10.6A, and it is. An auditor's independence would be impaired by Audit time restrictions, financial interests of the auditee. I mean, they all have potential here. Prior audits of the auditee. If you audit someone too much, you start becoming friends with them, building relationships, and you can lose uh, independence there. But this one is no doubt in your face, B is. Familiarity with an auditee's processes, no, not necessarily. That's a good thing. So I'm going to say the most likely one here is B, but it could also be C. But B, 11.11 .11 is B, and that is correct. All right, 11.13, due diligence in auditing would include the ability to comply with auditing standards and other directives. Due diligence in auditing would include the ability to comply with, yeah, sure, if you're, Due diligence should make that happen. Auditing standards and other directives, sure. Uh, expand the audit scope, no. You don't always want to expand audit scope depending on how many uh, resources you have in the objective. Ignore ethical misconduct, no, that's already out of there. Report as many oddity infractions as possible. No, as an auditor, it shouldn't be a game to see who can get the most findings because maybe uh, they are in compliance and, and you don't have to give... Your, your job is to objectively determine, are you meeting this requirement or not? So D is out of there. Comply, although I know auditors that do that, it's not right. Comply with the auditing standards and other directives? Yes, A. 11.13 has to be A, and it is. All right, congratulations. You have finished this video, or almost anyway. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. As you can see, I have a lot of experience at ASQ exams. I pass most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. And so I'd be more than happy to help you if you have any questions. You can contact me through my website at alphatc.com. And uh, there's a contact us option there. Click on that and send me a message. I'll get back with you as soon as possible. Hey, thank you and have a great day. Goodbye.